This is a Clockwork Pi game shell. It might be currently the best hardware to play Pico 8 games on. But it is also not perfect. Let me explain why. Hey, I'm Christian from Lazy Devs, and today we are doing something different. I wanted to show you some hardware that might be interesting for fantasy console devs. And you might even seen this one being posted around. The Game Shell is a modular, highly hackable mobile console that is the hotness right now. For good reasons. I mean, just look at it. It is simply a beautiful little handheld. High quality plastics, a sleek technical look, carefully chosen dimensions. A lot of open source handhelds these days try to pay tribute to the original Game Boy. They often end up looking garish and crass, like a child's drawing of what a Game Boy looked like. This one is an exception. It looks like something Nintendo or Sony would produce. Somebody who knows industrial design was working on this for quite a while. But strangely, the looks aren't actually the main selling point here. It's all about what's inside. It's a Raspberry Pi machine running Linux. It has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and, I mean, even a micro HDMI port. And yet, that's not even the best part. The knobs on both sides of the device don't control the volume, as you might think. Instead, you twist them to open it. Inside you'll find that all of the electronic components are split into five modules. Each module comes in its own casing of transparent plastic, and they are all connected by various cables. In fact, if you buy a game shell, it doesn't even come assembled. What you get is a box full of circuit boards and a bunch of sprues for all of the plastic parts. The idea is that you assemble the console yourself, like a, like a Gundam model. It might look daunting, but the the entire process is actually not much harder than building a small Lego kit. So if you're intimidated by soldering irons, you can relax, you won't need one here. And this is where we encounter somewhat of a paradox. The game shell really wants to be this super flexible, modular, hackable console. Like the pocket chip! It even comes with this super nerdy sticker sheet with all those maker type slogans on it. Highly hackable open source equipment in six different colors. But the modularity ends up being more of a gimmick than a useful feature. The five modules the game shell consists of can be assembled only in this one specific way. And it's not like I can have two screen modules to build like a 3DS for example. I can't even buy a screen module with a different resolution or size. There is just this one screen module. Spoiler alert, it's actually a very bad screen module too. Maybe the idea is that you can install those modules on your own 3D printed cases, which to me seems like taking the guts of a Lamborghini and installing them in your own car you made out of lard. But never mind that, because even the five default modules cannot be bought individually on the website anyway. You can only get a whole game shell kit. They recently released an upgraded mainboard, so maybe they are just getting started? But the customization implied by the module approach just isn't there yet. And come to think of it, why does the game shell even come as a kit? Typically you do that kind of thing to save costs. But it must have been a huge effort to make this assembly process so polished and foolproof. And it's not like the game shell is a cheap device. More on that later. What it feels like to me is that the modularity of the game shell is more of a marketing tool than an actual useful feature. And yet there is one aspect in which the DIY nature of the game shell shines through, but not necessarily in the best way. I'm talking about the software. The game shell boots up in this fairly polished looking main menu, huge icons indicate the different functions and pre-installed software. And while this looks nice and sleek, it just takes a few button presses to stumble across some issues. Buttons layout change across different parts of the menu. Sometimes you exit with A, sometimes with B. God only knows what adding ROMs to favorites does, but I certainly did it a lot by accident and it made my ROMs disappear from the list. Pairing Bluetooth devices is a never-ending headache of cryptic serial numbers, broken menus and non-existing feedback. So I guess that's actually what Bluetooth always is. And Pico 8, well, Pico 8 does have a menu icon 
but it's not actually installed. On the pocket chip it is. Instead you get a message telling you to get a Pico 8 copy and put it in a special folder. Which I guess is where the hacking part of the deal begins, because now you actually need to upload files to the game shell. So the game shell has an SD card, but it is not accessible when the device is assembled. You are not meant to put files on it this way. The game shell also has a USB port, but plugging it into a computer only charges it. You are not meant to put files on it this way either. Instead you are meant to log into it over the network. You can use the Windows Explorer and just type in the IP address. Uh, but that doesn't actually give you the full access. The way you are meant to interact with the game shell is using SSH and SCP. And if you are using Linux and command line interfaces every day, you're golden. This is probably your preferred method anyway, right? Right, but for the rest of us, this is a whole new universe of hoops to jump through just to get some files on your device. Even the steps to install Pico 8 are unnecessarily tedious. What does it mean? to put Pico 8 in a folder. Do I just put the zip file in it or do I have to unpack it? And where is my cards folder after I installed it? Because for some reasons it's not where you're supposed to put Pico 8 in. The answer is no, you don't unpack it and the cards folder is in a completely different folder that you might not be able to see because it is hidden and because Linux. Good luck. And yeah, this is generally my experience with Game Shell and yeah, with other hackable crowdfunded devices. Yeah, like the pocket chip too. There is usually a lot of focus on hyping up the product, but the user experience ends up being a little bit undercooked. The word hackable implies that a tech savvy community will provide support and workarounds for known issues and lacking features. You usually end up crawling from one pitfall to another, constantly revisiting the forums to look up threads that discuss solutions to your issues. To be fair, you will eventually get there. But also the answer you look for might be inside this mega thread started almost a year ago. And, and, and yes, yeah, some of the information might be actually out of date since then. So yeah, no problem. You just need to scroll through 380 replies to find out which information is still up to date. But wait, what are we actually even doing here? Am I really giving this beautiful little gem of a portable a negative review? Let's get back to what this is all about, which is playing Pico 8 games on it. Does it work? Yes, it does. Is it great? No. It is spectacular. As a Pico 8 developer, it might be easy to forget that Pico 8 is a place where you can play games, lots of games. By this point, it has amassed an incredible library of highly entertaining titles. I've always found that playing Pico 8 on a PC just really wasn't the ideal setup. The games don't lend themselves well to play sitting hunched over a keyboard. And yet, I wasn't really prepared for the change of perspective that the game shell offered. Action titles feel a lot more responsive with the classic Game Boy style buttons. Being able to play on a couch without an awkward laptop feels relaxing and liberating. And all of those games are accessible right here from the explore. No need to shuffle any files around. I found myself revisiting my favorite Pico 8 games. I found myself getting addicted to Alpine Alpaca and Just One Boss. And in the end, there is just something magical about holding a game in your hand. Some people online ask me if it's possible to develop games on the game shell. Technically, yes. Practically, meh. You can connect a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse, but then all you get is an underpowered, contrived laptop with a screen for ants. If you really need a portable Pico 8 game development environment, I recommend you can get a really cute used Asus netbook on eBay for, you know, half the price of this thing. Or the pocket chip. I've also received questions about the game shell's capability as an emulator, to which I have to answer it's it's fine, I guess. I'm not a big emulator fan. I often find that getting the games to run well can be very frustrating. So yeah, in this regard, the game shell is a typical emulator for me. I only tried Game Boy, GBA and NES. Game Boy and GBA suffer from the screen's native resolution. More on that later, but basically you either get a blurry image or a Game Boy for ants. After some fumbling with the settings, I got NES to look okay and so should Super NES, but to be honest, I haven't tried the Super NES. 
The game shell doesn't come configured to run SNES ROMs. I would need to scour the forums to figure out how to install an SNES emulator core, and I'd rather continue working on my LART Lamborghini. Let's call it a LART Borghini. Maybe later, when I actually have some games I want to play. There is also a PlayStation emulator pre-installed on the device, which I tested out of curiosity, and as almost everything on a game shell, it requires some work to get it to run. Even then, your selection of useful titles will be restricted. The game shell does not have an analog stick after all. And even shoulder buttons are... Um, a project. And also I even heard reports that some games might not run smoothly. But to be honest, it runs better than I expected. So yeah, there you go, here is Ridge Racer. Ridge Racer! Remember that one? It's funny that none of the reviewers I've seen even mention the Pico 8, because when it works, it's easily the most comfortable way to play games on a game shell. So there it is then, the game shell, a way to play our favorite Pico 8 games in style. A device every Pico 8 enthusiast needs? Well, uh, if you're looking for a simple thumbs up or thumbs down summary, I can't give you one. I'm still highly conflicted about the game shell. Yes, the gaming is sublime when it works, but then there's all those little things that make this handheld so inconvenient to live with. Here are some of the things I haven't even mentioned yet. <coughs> the battery is very small, even though there's all this empty space in the lower half of the shell. Recharging it is weirdly contrived. Yeah, like the pocket chip too. Every time you plug it into USB, it powers on by itself. So I guess maybe the device needs to be running to charge the battery, but then it automatically powers off after some time being not used. The volume control is digital and not analog like back in the days with the Game Boy. It relies on a software having proper support. Depending on a software, you might not be able to control the volume. And yes, this includes, you guessed it, Pico 8. And yet, this is still better than the screen brightness, which you can control only in the main menu. So you need to quit whatever you are doing in order to change it. Speaking of which, the screen is an inconvenient resolution for Pico 8. At 240 pixels height, it's slightly below double the Pico 8 resolution. So you either play in native resolution, which makes the image tiny, or you size up to double resolution, which cuts off parts of the image at the top and bottom or you use the default, which is scaling up to 240 pixels. This makes some pixels appear smaller than others, which, I mean, um, it, it's fine. It's, it's really, it's fine. I mean, re really, I'm fine. It's fine. It's, I'm, I mean, sometimes if I squint, I can almost, okay, wait. <sighs> We, we need to go deeper into this rabbit hole. You see, the developers of the game shell made a very, 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 very bad choice with the screen panel. Not only is the resolution inconvenient, it also uses a weird staggered pixel arrangement where the individual pixels in the panel are not on a rectangular grid. So actually, no matter what you do, you will never get clean, sharp pixel art on the game shell. There will always be some blurriness or jagged lines or flickering. I mean... That kind of mistake is only understandable. Who could have expected we would take this device to put games on it, right? It looks a lot better on the pocket chip. Okay, so moving on. Since this is a full-fledged computer, it needs to boot up every time you turn it on. And the boot time is... Around 30 seconds. Yeah, that's faster than a pocket chip. Which is still inconvenient for a quick game session when waiting for the bus. There is no sleep mode to get around it either. Yeah, I've been spoiled by modern handhelds. 
All of these are nitpicks, but they keep nagging at me as I continue using this device, which is why I'm struggling to give the game shell a wholehearted recommendation. And let us not forget the pricing. The game shell currently sells for 150 bucks. That's without shipping. Along with taxes, I ended upwards of 200 euro to get this delivered to Germany. Competing retro handhelds like BitBoy can be as cheap as 50 euro. Same as the pocket chip. This makes the game shell a premium product. At that price point, every inconvenience just makes me second guess my investment. So I can't give the game shell my unequivocal recommendation, at least not yet. But also, I have to also kind of admit, I, I kind of love it. It's Yes, it's flawed, yes, it's expensive, but it's so easy on the eyes and it feels so great to play on it. It made me appreciate the Pico 8 games on a whole new level. It has become my go-to gameplay testing device for my own project. So while it is not a handheld for everybody, maybe, just maybe, if you are willing to put up with its flaws, if you are willing to invest the time necessary to make it do what you want to do, if you are willing to pay the price, then maybe, just maybe, it might be a handheld for you. And if not, then maybe some handheld in the future will seal the deal. Fantasy consoles and especially Pico 8 have come a long way. At this point, they offer an impressive lineup of outstanding games. To me, the game shell shows a glimpse of what a Pico 8 handheld can deliver. But there is also so much room for improvement. So with some luck, it's just a matter of time until a hardware developer takes advantage of this opportunity. And with that, thank you for watching and listening to me talking about this expensive toy I got. Uh, let me know what you think of this new format in the comments section. I might do something like this in the future about some other hardware. Like the pocket chip? Until then, see you next time and bye bye.